there is a structural problem between the two countries and the United States is feeling the competition much more and perhaps senses that it may have fallen behind in terms of competitiveness on technology and even in the defense field. But notwithstanding that, I think the United States recognizes that China is now the second major power in the world. No other country really has the economic or military capability to rival either the United States or China. And therefore, there is no option but to deal with the Chinese. You're on Strand News Global. I'm Nitin Gokhale. On our evening program, The Gist, we're going to discuss the recent signs of thought between the United States and China and uh, its implications for the world and especially for India. And to do that, my guest today is former Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale, who is also now an author, uh, who is uh, as prolific as you can get in uh, recent times. So thank you, Vijay, for coming over to the studio. You've come all the way from Pune, but thanks for all doing this time. Thank you, Nitin. So, uh, let me uh, you know ask you first up uh, that uh, reports all over the place uh, about the US-China thaw, but you know the world actually is focused on what's happening in the uh, Middle East, Israel-Hamas conflict. But on the sidelines, this itself also is an important uh, development that uh, the Americans are speaking extensively to the Chinese and seems uh, there could be a summit meeting between the two presidents, uh, China and US. What do you think of this? So we need to keep a close watch on what's happening. Uh, Nitin, frankly speaking, the relationship with the US uh, and China has been in free fall for three years. Uh, they have kept talking about putting a floor to that relationship, but they didn't succeed. But if you see in the last three months, three cabinet secretaries, the secretaries of state, commerce and treasury have gone to Beijing. Uh, the national security advisor has uh, talked more positively about China. Now, given the problems between the two countries, nobody is expecting a huge breakthrough. Uh, but even if they begin the process of uh, restoring a certain normalcy in the relationship, it will obviously have a global impact. But I want to add one more point, which I think uh, you know your viewers will be interested in. I spent a month in the US just before coming on your show. Uh, this sense that... Um, there is a difference between the Republicans and the Democrats on foreign policy in general mm -hmm. is something we need to be very careful about because in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, there is a bipartisan debate going on which is not Republican versus Democrat mm -hmm. but which is those who believe that America should continue uh, being the major force behind the current global order and maintaining the global order and those who feel that America has spent enough of its treasure and blood doing that at its own cost. Right. And therefore, uh, you know, irrespective of what happens in the 2024 election or what happens in San Francisco at this summit, uh, we have to be aware of the longer term implication of this debate. Because if America turns inward, then it not only impacts the Sino-US relationship, it, it also impacts the United States relationship with every other partner. And we are one of the important partners. Yeah, yes. So that's an interesting point you made. And since it's from your personal experience there, uh, what is the mood in the US in the current administration about uh, the Sino-US relationship? I know that they're trying to repair the damage, whatever is happening. But uh, simultaneously, they can also keep talking about decoupling, de-risking. Uh, is that a two-drink-track approach that they have, a parallel approach that they're taking? So I think there's no uh, doubt about the fact that uh, the US has taken a significant turn away from the 1972 consensus under which uh, President Nixon and Mao Zedong restored the normal relationship between China and the United States. There's a structural problem between the two countries and the United States is feeling the competition much more and perhaps senses that it may have fallen behind in terms of competitiveness on technology and even in the defense field. But notwithstanding that, I think the United States recognizes that China is now the second major power in the world. No other country really has the economic or military capability to rival either the United States or China. And therefore, there is no option but to deal with the Chinese. 
So I think what they are trying to do in this last year of the Biden administration is to put some kind of uh, a policy in place which both parties can agree to where the competition will remain and where U.S. policies or de-risking will continue. But it will not degenerate into a conflictual situation or into an adversarial situation where the United States will have to divert its attention towards China when it has so many other problems and issues on its plate. There is Ukraine, there is Middle East, and there is the domestic uh, economy also. So I think um, it's an effort to uh, reduce tension because they need to reduce it at this point of time. It's a pragmatic approach, I suppose, they have taken. Yes. It's not a it was a real approach. Uh, you talk, talked about uh, other issues that they need to focus on. Middle East is one big challenge anyway, because Ukraine and Russia seems to have fallen off the radar, at least in the public domain. Uh, so, uh, does the US get diverted or its attention gets diverted from uh, its relationship issues with China to Middle East, or they have, have to uh, handle both? You know, it's not a question of two. There are three crises going on simultaneously. Yes. There is Russia, Ukraine, there is what is happening in West Asia, and there is the um, uh, the tension in the Taiwan Strait. That's right. So, uh, does America have the capability to handle three crises together? Yeah. I would hesitate to, uh, uh, to reply in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. Because despite the size of its economy uh, and its formidable military capabilities, these are three regions which are fairly distant from each other. Sure. Three different theatres in a sense. Yes. And whether it has the capacity to sustain uh, 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 a possible confrontation in all three theatres uh, is something that I don't think is possible anymore. Uh, I don't think Russia and Ukraine have gone off the radar. In fact, when I was in the US, the whole discussion was very much about how much longer they could afford to sustain the war effort. Right. Uh, then, of course, the Middle East crisis happened and clearly there the United States has taken a clear position, yes. uh, which is that it needs to back Israel. But privately, there are uh, concerns that uh, Israel might have gone a little too far because according to various reports, uh, over 9,000 uh, people like, have, have, di have died in Gaza. Uh, and then the uh, Sino-US relationship is still fraught with tension, despite what might happen in San Francisco. Whether that modus vivendi will hold is also a question. So, I think the U.S. is um, facing multiple uh, challenges and it has to deal with them uh, uh, just as it is entering an election cycle. Exactly. So, this three-front challenge is not easy to deal with for any country. I mean, leave alone uh, in random sense. So, let me flip this question to the, the Chinese side. Xi Jinping obviously is facing uh, some uh, headwinds, some turbulence as we, we see uh, from reports. Uh, he sacked two ministers uh, recently, uh, supposedly his confidants. So is he uh, willing to uh, keep on uh, this crisis uh, going and sort of contribute to it or take advantage of those crises uh, when uh, he himself is facing uh, opposition, let's say, or some turbulence in the domestic issues? Well, I think it's fair to say that the way they have acted on the crisis in the Middle East, the very measured statements they have made, the way they have come out in support of uh, the the Palestine uh, cause uh, suggests that they see this as an opportunity to weaken the American position in the Middle East. They already began that process when they brokered the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran, although it is, I think, unfair to give them the entire credit for it, but they provided the platform. Uh, now, in the current situation where the US has taken a very clear uh, pro-Israel position, the Chinese perhaps see this as yet another opportunity to make inroads geopolitically in that region. Geoeconomically, of course, they're already there. They have massive investments and they have massive energy deals. So incrementally, I think this is going to strengthen uh, the Chinese position. Uh, so far as Ukraine is concerned, the Chinese have taken a position there too. Yes. And uh, whether we wish to admit it or not, I think there is a bit of a stalemate in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which works to Russia's advantage yes. and therefore to China's yes. advantage. Yes. So I think overall, despite his domestic uh, problems, and these are quite, uh, 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 they are not few in number, I would say that on the foreign policy front, perhaps after a few years, China is doing fairly okay. Looks like. Because uh, everywhere they have the advantage, they are having sided with Russia, 
uh, in Russia, Ukraine thing, uh, like we said, uh, they have the advantage. And in Taiwan states, of course, uh, they are an interested party in what's happening there. So that brings me to the question of what India should be doing. I mean, you know, if you look at the overall uh, discussion that we've had so far, um, India, to me, seems in a difficult position, but I would like your take on this on uh, Russia, Ukraine. But before that, uh, if the Sino-US relations go back to being uh, uh, of less tension than what they have been in the last three years, despite what they talk about de-risking, decoupling, where does it leave uh, countries like India? Well, you know, we have been in difficult situations before as well. And if I were to quote uh, another former foreign secretary, one of my senior colleagues, who said that, you know, I think India has maintained its strategic balance very well. For instance, on the Russia-Ukraine war, it has imported oil from Russia and maintained that relationship, even as it has strengthened uh, the strategic partnership with the United States. We have straddled that fairly well. When I was in the US in this past month, uh, there was a better understanding of India's position. They may not like it, but they accept it. Uh, similarly, I think on the Middle East, um, uh, although uh, we uh, initially appeared to have taken a, a strong support uh, for uh, Israel, the fact is that that was a, a support expressed because a terrorist attack occurred. And subsequently, the External Affairs Ministry has issued a balancing statement. There too, I think we have uh, uh, maintained a strategic balance. I would think overall, we are fairly good at, 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 that, uh, well, and thank, at that task. The real challenge for us is the longer these conflicts uh, uh, persist, uh, the more the choices are forced upon us. And you can't straddle uh, the fence all the time. So I think it is in our interest that the, uh, that the situation gets uh, abates in the Middle East. We have crucial relationships, as you know, and, uh, and those have done very well in right. the past uh, a few years. Uh, so I think um, at this stage... Um, I think we are, it's a wait and watch position, but we have maintained the balance fairly well, I think. That's true. But uh, coming to specifically Sino-US relationship and its impact on other court partners, let's say, if not the world, um, obviously the Australians are talking to the Chinese. Uh, there appears to be some kind of a thaw there itself. Whereas we are locked, India is locked in a confrontation on the border for the past three and a half years now. And uh, there's a, doesn't seem to be much progress, although military, mili military to military talks are on. Yeah. But other uh, forms of communication don't appear to be uh, as active as before. So uh, what is the prognosis there? I really can't tell you what the prognosis is. But what I can tell you is that I have felt at least for the last 12 months mm -hmm. that you have no option but to commence a dialogue with China mm -hmm. simply because you don't have the luxury of, se of being separated by oceans or by continents. Right. And having a dialogue per se does not mean you concede ground. You can talk and at the same time on the ground you can deter. Uh, talking does not mean you are conceding either your claim uh, with relation to certain issues or the facts on the ground are going to change. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you don't talk, uh, at some point uh, of time, I think that situation will have to change simply because you are two big neighbors uh, with a common problem. Right. So I am in favor of uh, some form of dialogue with the Chinese side and particularly given the fact that all our quad partners have resumed those contacts, uh, uh, standing out uh, um, of that uh, arena uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, it makes our task only more difficult when the time will come for us to talk to them. Right. So... Um Finally, uh, since you spoke about the need for a dialogue between India and China, um, it becomes more and more difficult uh, because both their domestic positions are also becoming difficult in a sense, especially in India because we are now entering the election cycle. So uh, does that affect uh, any of the approach I mean, in your past experience or uh, that can stand alone and still go, go on the dialogue? I don't think that the India-China relations have in that sense become a political uh, debating point during the, the general elections in India. Pakistan is a sui generis case and for historical reasons, yes, uh, starting with 1947. Um, provided you don't have any fresh disturbance or, uh, uh, or problem that the Chinese create for you, uh, I think that this is an issue which uh, will not figure in the public debate 
as much as other domestic issues, the economy, the climate, and so on will figure. Uh, so, and I, I'm absolutely confident that, uh, you know, our uh, armed forces are uh, ready to tackle any issue. So, right. I really, therefore, don't see this as being a deterrent to having a political dialogue with them. Right. Now, of course, I am uh, not in the government, so I can't say what the government thinking in this matter right. is. But I feel that... Uh, as I said, uh, talking does not mean you are conceding anything. Oh, well, that's a good point. And I think, uh, therefore, at least, uh, well, thankfully, the military to military dialogue seems to be on from yeah. what we hear. Uh, but uh, we are waiting to hear whether there's any political dialogue or any back channel that is happening or not happening. But perhaps uh, India should take a cue and both India and China should take a cue from what is happening between uh, US and China and then Australia and China and Japan and China. Yeah. So I think uh, that's where I think we need to hope and we need to, uh, to understand that uh, talking is important. But thank you very much for these insights. I think it was important to know what the Americans think about the Chinese uh, competition and uh, where they're going. So thanks for that insight. Uh, we will talk to you uh, when uh, an occasion arises again. But thank you for coming in and uh, giving us uh, this insight. Thank you, Nitin. Pleasure. So uh, that was uh, former Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale, who is now also a prolific author, as I mentioned. Uh, this was a very uh, useful conversation to understand where the world is going as far as uh, major power competition is concerned. Uh, so do keep watching Strat News Global. You know where to reach us. Our uh, social media handles are visible to uh, you on the screen. And your comments and feedback are always welcome as you know. So until the next time, it's goodbye.